Welcome to our Bible study for Sunday, the 25th of April, 2021, being the fourth Sunday after Easter. And what do we have going on this week? Well, we're in Easter tide, of course, and so we still have the first lesson being from the Acts of the Apostles rather than from the Old Testament. And here we are in chapter four of the Acts of the Apostles, where we're talking about the rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, all of the high priestly family. They have brought prisoners before them. And who are these prisoners? They are Peter and John. Why have they been brought in? Well, it's because they've been preaching and teaching the name of Jesus Christ. They have actually healed a man uh, in the temple. They're accused of violating Sabbath laws. They're accused of various things that have been brought before the Sanhedrin in order to explain their actions, preaching and healing in Jesus' name. Peter's explanation, Peter makes in one of his speeches in Acts here, and Peter's explanation is that the power by which uh, he and other believers act is found in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, this takes us back to one of the things we've talked about in the past, which is, what is when we say that a word or a name is numinous, N-U, M-I-N-O-U-S, numinosity. It's a good word you can drop to sound fancy. A name is numinous when speaking it has power, or a word is numinous when speaking it has power. Now, unfortunately, the only examples that most of us can relate to when it comes to numinosity are negative examples, hateful words. When we talk about hate speech, when we talk about all those words that shouldn't be used because their only intention is to harm somebody else, they would be numinous in a very negative sense. But words and names can be numinous in a positive sense. Uh, we could take a simple phrase like, I love you, and if it is meant with all sincerity, that phrase expresses a particular uh, power when uh, the love is welcome and when the love is godly. But when we talk about a name being numinous, we have to restrict ourselves way, way down. And the first name that we would refer to would be the holy name of God, which we conventionally translate as I am or I am who I am. And this is the name that God reveals to Moses at chapter three, verse 14 in Exodus. But Jesus is also a name that has power. Now, first of all, we should note that the name Jesus itself means something. It means the Lord saves. The name that we conventionally translate as I am conventionally gets transliterated as the Lord, all capitals, L-O-R-D. So when we say the Lord saves, in Hebrew that becomes Yeshua, Jesus. And Peter saying we are acting in the power of Jesus' name, he is saying God is present here. He's making a twofold claim. One, that the name of Jesus is powerful. Second, that the Lord God himself is present in Jesus' name, is present in Jesus Christ. And the uh, Sanhedrin is gonna pick up on that. Uh, and so their reaction to Peter, which is actually gonna be fairly muted, but their reaction to Peter is going to be all the more particular because they know what he's talking about here. He testifies to the lordship of Jesus Christ and that there is power in his name. He quotes Psalm 118, verse 22 in the prayer book version, the stone that was rejected has become the chief cornerstone as evidence that the risen Lord has triumphed over his enemies. This echoes Jesus' own use of the same verse at Luke chapter 20, verse 17. Now remember, the various 
followers of Jesus Christ have been talking since he has reappeared, since he has risen from the grave. And so while Peter was not there to hear Jesus use all the words he used, everybody's talked about every word that Jesus Christ used after being raised. They have shared these. Peter concludes his speech, therefore, with the essential Christian proclamation. There's a technical term for this. It's called kerygma, K-E-R-Y-G-M-A, kerygma. And originally, this is a technical term in and of itself. It means the proclamation given by a herald, a royal herald, when he shows up in your town and says, there's a new king. Uh, we've talked about this before, but if you wanted to take all of the letters of the Apostle Paul and put them down to one phrase, it would be something along the lines, there's a new king, his name is Jesus Christ, here is how you live in his kingdom. And so Peter brings that down to the proclamation that Jesus is Lord, and here at verse 12, that there is salvation in no one else but Jesus Christ. Now, in our pluralistic age, we fall into the trap of saying, well, you know, uh, what do we do about salvation if it seems exclusive here? Is that being nice? Is that being fair? Forgetting that saying that we have to be nice is not exactly part of the proclamation anyway. This is what is known in theology as the scandal of particularity, that there is salvation by and through Jesus Christ only. And we have to take the man at his word. When he says at John 14, 6, for example, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. That's the scandal of particularity. We can, in the proclamation, always say, there is no salvation but by Jesus Christ. But we can't judge whether somebody's saved because we're not going to see whether they're saved. They could be the most heinous sinner we've ever met. They could be somebody who confesses another God, but they could still be saved. We might not witness this. What we can say with certainty, 100%, is that if they are saved, it will be by God's grace and by Jesus Christ. So let's stick with our kerygma, as we have promised in our baptismal covenant, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ Jesus. Now moving on, we get to Psalm 23, which is absolutely the best known psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, it is an individual song of trust, probably originally a royal song, probably original to David. Not all the Psalms were. The image of a shepherd was universal in the ancient world for kings, so we're getting that royal theme again, emphasizing leadership and providence for the king's subjects. If we go back to chapter 34 of Ezekiel, the Lord God says, I will be your shepherd to his people. Quite apart from Jesus' use of this image in John chapter 10, Revelation chapter 7 verse 17 applies the image of the shepherd to the lamb, Jesus Christ. So Jesus is both the shepherd and the lamb of God. A hint of the history of the Hebrews captivity is found in verse four, which says, I shall fear no evil, with the root used for evil in Hebrew being a cognate for the name of the Egyptian god Ra. Uh, remember, the Hebrews have been captive, slaves in Egypt, subject to genocide. So, I shall fear no evil. I won't fear your Egyptian gods. I will not fear Ra. Because why? The Hebrews were delivered from Ra, delivered from evil, by the Lord, their shepherd. Uh, evil has been defeated, Ra has been defeated by Ro'i, which is Hebrew for shepherd, 
my shepherd, row e, my shepherd. There's a lot of wordplay going on here. The psalm is filled with personal pronouns, my shepherd, framed by the proper name of the Lord, that name I am we just spoke of, emphasizing that God's presence is intimate. We can compare the psalm to Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 44, the feeding of the 5,000 in Mark's account, because Jesus in Acts embodies, incarnates the 23rd Psalm. Mark has Jesus take pity on the people because they are like sheep without a shepherd, verse 34 there. Uh, this is after we're told that they're in the wilderness, in other using a word eramon, which means desert or dry place. And yet, even though we're in a desert, uh, we're told that the people are sitting on green grass at Mark 6, 39. In other words, he maketh me lie down in green pastures. And then Jesus multiplies the loaves and the fishes. In other words, he sets a rich table before me. Lying in a green pasture, the people are fed abundantly. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Now, I have to tell you that no matter what translation people are used to, uh, in a death room, you use the King James Version. That's what people want, whether they've ever been to church or not, or that's what the family wants. And uh, most people, with any connection, with any kind of worship or any familiarity with the Bible, they'll know the Lord's Prayer and they'll know the 23rd Psalm. And so if your beeper goes off as chaplain and you get called in in the middle of the night somewhere, you better know the 23rd Psalm and have it with you. You better know the Lord's Prayer. Now I think we should know those anyway, so let's work at that. Uh, our epistle, is from the first letter of John in chapter three here. John develops his argument that love is the mark of being God's children. Remember, there are four different words in Greek for love. There is the word that refers to romantic love, eros. We're used to that as the root of the word erotic in English. There is the word for brotherly love, philios like in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. There is a more obscure word, storge, which refers to uh, love of place or thing. So if we love our hometown, if we love our birthplace, if we're attached to something that way, that's storge. But the highest form of love is agape, uh, which sometimes gets translated as charity because it's caritas in Latin. This is the one that uh, St. Paul uses in the first chapter, or in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Love is patient, love is kind. He's referring to agape there. And here John is saying that is the mark of being God's children, that we engage in self-giving love, sacrificial love. Having stated that God makes us his children and that those born of God do not sin, John enjoins that Christians must love one another. We're in this together. We're part of the same body. And we give of ourselves for each other. Uh, we take this theme of how Christians must love one another and develop this into a statement of how believers must be confident before God. John starts running with his own argument here. So the model for love is that given by Jesus, that he laid down his life for us. Now we can compare chapter 15, where Jesus talks about this in John's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 13, or John 10, 13, uh, John 10, 11, and verse uh, 15. On a day-to-day -day basis, love is expressed in action by sharing with those in need, for example. To go back to St. Paul's famous chapter in 1 Corinthians that we hear at most weddings, Paul uses 15 verbs and adverbial phrases to say what love is. In other words, he's saying what love does, not how it feels, but what love does. John makes the same point here. Our confidence before God 
flows from our obeying his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another. So that kerygma gets worked back in there. Our love for one another flows from as and is in conformity with our belief in Jesus Christ. That takes us back to the power of the name. Because self-giving love is hard. And if we try to do it based on our own resources, we'll eventually burn out and fail. When we do it in the name of Jesus Christ, when we do it reminding ourselves that we do it in the name of Jesus Christ, God starts giving us his power to act. When you are called to give of yourself, do so by praying in the name of Jesus Christ. Pray for the grace to deal with the hurt that requires you to give more. Pray for the grace to deal with the exhaustion when you've given all that you have. Pray in Jesus' name that by his power he may give you more to give. Our gospel lesson takes us through some verses I've already given us here in John's gospel because we're in chapter 10 in John's gospel where we get the figure of Jesus and the sheep. John uses the figure of speech of the shepherd from the start of his teaching at verse one in this section. In treating the crowd as sheep without a shepherd, Jesus recalls the feeding of the 5,000 that we talked about in Mark chapter six and echoes the imagery from Psalm 23. He's also recalling Ezekiel 34 because other than Psalm 23, the other scripture that we're referring to here, nobody's heard when Jesus is speaking. There is no New Testament. They'll remember Ezekiel 34. They'll remember Psalm 23. The sheep are left wandering as prey for wolves. That's what happens at Ezekiel 34. And then the Lord promises to go and gather his sheep. Here in John, Jesus identifies himself by one of his I am sayings, ego a me in Greek, I am, using the proper name of God. He says, I am the gate. And that goes back to Ezekiel 34 as well. Not only am I the good shepherd, I am the gate. In Ezekiel 34, the Lord is the shepherd and also the gate by which his flock goes in and out. Now let's talk about I am a little bit because Jesus uses this uh, name revealed to Moses. You're not supposed to pronounce it aloud, which is why uh, the Pharisees seek to stone him in chapter eight of John when he says before Abraham was, I am. In Greek, uh, Greek is what's called a, uh, declined language, conjugated language, inflected language, let's say. And so the verb ending uh, includes the personal pronoun. So if I were to take the verb for to be, I nay in Greek, and say I am, I would say a me. That would be the first person present active indicative of I nay, I me, I am. To add the personal pronoun, ego, which means I, is extremely emphatic, uh, and that will sometimes happen. But the only reason Jesus is doing it here is, is to make the holy name apparent, that great I am from Exodus 3.14. So he's saying, I am the shepherd, I am the gate, the same way the Lord God Almighty did in Ezekiel 34. Uh, what God actually says at Ezekiel 34, verses 30 to 31, speaking of Israel, and they shall know that I, the Lord, and that's where he says, I am. So I'm gonna say every time he says, I am. And they shall know that I, I am their God, am with them, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, says the Lord God, Adonai, I am. And you are my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, and I am your God, says the Lord God. Adonai, I am. Adonai is Lord, lowercase, as a title. Uh, so we've got the proper name and the title mixed here in Ezekiel 34. John 
uh, has a different theology of crucifixion from that of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so after Jesus has said that he is the good sheep, he then goes on and says, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. In the Synoptic Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, we have the agony in the garden, for example. Not in John, because in John, Jesus is always in charge. He gives his self up. I lay my life down. I can take it back up again. Here, uh, with this complete power, we can actually say that where in the other Gospels, Jesus is raised, in John, he rises. Now, we don't need to worry about the contrast between the two because Jesus is God. So whether he is raised or whether he rises, whether we say he is raised by the Father or rises, we're talking about the same God, one God in three persons. The crucifixion here is the culmination of the plan of salvation, which is why Jesus says on the cross when he dies, Tetelestai, it is finished. The plan of salvation and the work that the Father has given to him. Salvation is accomplished. Uh, the verb here has been given by the Father because this, he says, the Father loves me at, verb seven, at verse 17 here. The verb is perfect, that is action which is completed in the past with continuing effect. It is not what is in Greek an aorist verb, action completed in the past. In other words, the work of Jesus continues. Salvation is ongoing in the Lord, ongoing in the holy name of God, ongoing by and through the all-powerful name of Jesus Christ. Just as he says, I am the good shepherd, he is making it abundantly clear who he is to his listeners in first century Palestine and to us today. May we always be the sheep who hear our shepherd's voice and follow him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.